everybody. Today we're going to talk about content development, uh, the ins and outs, what are the parameters, the possibilities. Uh, we've, we're also going to talk about artificial intelligence and where that intersects. And we're also going to talk about where you can learn how to create augmented reality content today. So Catherine uh, was going to be uh, chairing this panel, and she was not able to attend, so I'm stepping in. Uh, my name is Zenka. I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves. Oh, starting now? <laughs> I'll do it last. I'm, I'm Jackie Mori. Um, I uh, have a company called All These Worlds uh, for VR development, and I've had a couple companies for AR development that I'll talk about a little more in uh, the panel when we talk about content. And um, I've been doing this for quite a long time, so it's exciting to see so many new people jumping into this amazing technology. Hi, I'm Ann Greenberg. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I founded my first company to do immersive storytelling 25 years ago, and it's been an incredible journey. Um, in that time frame, uh, I had to take a deep dive into the underlying structures, and that led to the creation of my second company, which was Grace Note, which is the largest entertainment data company in the world. Um, and so I'm extremely interested in, the, uh, in what happens to data in the 3D world and how and what it means, uh, especially for VR and AR. I'm Pauline Felder. I'm the CEO of Augmented Expeditions, and we are developing uh, guided walking tours that incorporate AR with an educational uh, component and, um, and some gameplay. So, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, Bonnie Bogovich, I'm a game audio designer. I've spent about a decade or so working in entertainment, started with theater and found my way into games, uh, a lot of which was about five years. I was the audio lead at Shell Games where I got introduced to virtual reality. Um, and I've worked on about eight VR titles and two, uh, eight VR titles and two AR titles since. And um, I'm hoping to help remind people that even though we are now using, you know, augmented reality instead of virtual reality is the focus, audio is still a very important component, and when used well, it can really help enhance the experience. Thank you. And I'm Zenka. Uh, I'm an artist and a futurist. Uh, I've been working in augmented reality since 2012, installing massive augmented reality murals, and also artwork, and also installations in physical spaces. Um, I work in custom augmented reality mobile apps. I'm also going to be talking about the future of uh, XR 2.0 and how to find um, sources for uh, creating new app ideas uh, on the main stage on Thursday at 2.30. So we're going to go into the future. So let's talk now about what makes AR so unique and how we can leverage that uniqueness. And when you guys go out there to make this content, what things are going to make it worth it for people to install? What areas can you get into, whether it's Geo or um, the different platforms? So let's, let's take a pass through the panel to talk about what makes AR unique and how we can leverage those possibilities. I think the coolest thing about AR is how much you can integrate it with the physical world. So your reality is now more than just physical because you can add things to it, you can enhance it, you can extend it, you can in, add all kinds of things that engage us with the physical reality in different ways. So I think that's the unique thing for me. Yeah, I, I would agree. And extending on that, um, one of the things I think is really interesting is how you're dealing with uh, what kind of geolocation and mapping technology you're using. Uh, a thing that we ran into um, several years ago with a 360 uh, platform and application that we were building it was the first one to use accelerometers to navigate inside of um, iOS. Uh, but everything in that um, that was captured in that shoot and share application uh, required a geolocation on Earth, and that's how it was architected. And we ran into some problems. Um, for instance, when we were building um, what I considered the future of the album cover, which I thought should be immersive, since we lost that as we. Uh, at those experiences that we had pouring over album covers. Um, uh, we, with Interscope and, and Black Star, we created um, an immersive album cover, which uh, basically we shot all in 360. Now the question became how to locate that on a map, 
And, uh, you know, did we use the artist's um, hometown of Baltimore where he created the hip hop, Baltimore hip hop sound? Or did we use the label location? Or was it the physical location of where we shot the album art, which is a home in downtown LA? Or uh, was it the fantasy location that some of the songs were, were pointing to? And so this became kind of a big debate. Uh, and we ended up creating kind of a fantasy location and then tying that to uh, Los Angeles as the, as the location. But, um, but I think this is uh, one of the unique qualities about AR, which is even though we're tying, tying it to a physical world, um, how you're describing that world and what it means in, in multiple different planes is actually really important. Mm -hmm. And, and um, along with that, I, I think also it gives us um, sort of new levels of which to examine situations and going out into the community. It gives us different levels um, to interact with what's going on, as, as Jackie had said. And it really helps bring us up from our smart devices and interact with the world again, because we've, our smart device development has brought us all straight down here. So I, we really love the aspects of AR that let us interact with the real world and bring us back out of our lap. Uh, <laughs> so. And I guess going more on the entertainment route, uh, I find that being able to take your device anywhere and place toys almost anywhere in your house. I worked on a fun game last year called Domino World for the Tango. And one of my favorite bits is you could walk around your entire house and lay domino trails on your cat and your parents <laughs> and anywhere you want and just knock one off and follow it. And we designed it so the audio actually follows. So if you forget where your dominoes are going, you could actually use your device as a guide to chase it down. and. You don't need to have a specific location for that. The fact that you can go in anyone's home anywhere and just start playing was great. And again, I find that uh, following along with the neck issue, uh, we are now in the generation where everyone's starting to get, I think it's called cell phone neck pain. It's almost an actual registered health issue. Finding any way to keep people's visuals up and in the real world, I'm a big fan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're entering an interesting phase right now in augmented reality. If you're thinking about developing content, I think the first question you have to ask yourself is what are people going to look at this on? You know, that's always the first question because if they're going to be looking at it on their phone or if they're going to have a Tango device or whether they're going to have a headset, that's kind of your first question. Mm -hmm. The second question is if I'm going to make them install an app on their phone, is this going to be worth it? You know, I find that it's a really big leap between um, that installation process is a big leap. So if you're having, you know, if you're displaying work, um, for example, the banners outside are now showing um, some of the eight great leaders of um, this field. Um, it would be great to have set up iPads or, um, you know, right there looking at that content. I also feel like you have to tell the story afterwards for all the people that are not going to install your app. So that's an important element as well. Um, so one of the things that makes augmented reality unique is it's got that wow fa factor. And the other thing is, is that sometimes when you create things, the stuff you think would be really cool is not really cool. <laughs> yeah. And that's happened a lot. So the more complex and expensive your project is to develop, the more you need to test it. Um, there's an app called um, Erasma, which has full features in that you can do 3D, you can do sound, you can do video, you can do transparency, and it's free. And I teach it to first graders, okay, in 30 minutes. So if you ha don't have a RASMA installed on your phone and if you haven't created a studio account, that's your first chance to test out all these ideas that you want to do. You know, a lot of times augmented re reality experiences that you create are too long. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the trigger is not strong enough. Sometimes you've loaded so many 3D data um, objects in it that it jitters. So these are the things you want to work out. Um, sound is also really important, so do not leave that as as a last thing. But a lot of times these mobile things, you want to just keep it very short and sweet. So now I want to let Anne and Jacqueline talk a little bit about augmented or artificial intelligence because as we deal with all these converging technologies, we're going to have to start looking at augmented reality 2.0. And I encourage you to develop apps that we can use right now, but then be thinking of all the apps you want to create when everybody has a HoloLens. 
because that's where it's gonna go and it's gonna go quickly. So mm -hmm. talk about some of the data underlying and how we're gonna enter this age of personalization. Um, well, I, I think that, um, first of all, one of the things that you touched on, uh, which is how you approach your production is incredibly important. Um, you know, a, as you said, some of the stuff you're going to create is not gonna be that compelling or interesting. I mean, we're still in an incredibly experimental stage, and so I think people should be doing tons of very boring, uninteresting <laughs> uh, experiments because, um, you know, th now's the time to do that and to work it out and figure out what, what it is that makes sense to you first. You know, you're the first milieu. And um, in doing so and building your businesses around this, you really need to think about reusing those assets across multiple domains all the way from you know AR and VR, XR, whatever you want to call it, uh, because some of those platforms haven't even been thought of yet. Um, but you know, and looking backwards to 2D and what assets you've done there. So trying to think about the things that you're creating uh, as working across multiple platforms, not necessarily at the same time, but with an archival perspective, and in doing so. Thinking about, um, you know, sort of kind of archival into the future, uh, but being able to retrieve those things and make them um, recognizable and or reusable. Mm -hmm. uh, and that means, of course, you're going to start dealing with how you're labeling this stuff, how you're um, restoring it, and of course, the, the metadata associated with it. And I think that that's where we start to see um, a real difference in the 3D technologies is that the data also has to become much more complex in 3D. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, you know, you, you want to start thinking about uh, how do I create these assets so they live across multiple properties so that we can actually make money over time across multiple plat platforms, right? You're creating uh, your, arc, your own... Um, uh, IP collection, um, but um, in terms of AI, I think this is super interesting because the data that we're using to enable search and discovery, which traditionally has been metadata, um, now is actually going to enable um, all different kinds of creation. Um, creation, collaborative creation between multiple users, uh, potentially working across time and space on a 3D object. Uh, and um, also collaboration with machines. So machines are gonna become increasingly creative. I know we've, all of us creators have carved out that area of, of as a safe haven for the vanishing job markets, um, but um, truthfully, uh, you know, the brute force of AI and some of the more elegant solutions that are starting to be developed um, will enable uh, certainly machines to be somewhat creative, and I know I'm controversial when I, when I talk about that, but. Yeah, I think we've got a ways to go for that. But um, <clears throat> but I do think what you're saying about AI being part of the infrastructure of a larger AR universe is um, is some place that we need to be thinking about going that we're probably not as involved in as we make our individual sort of one-off applications right now. Um, I, I, I hope we get to talk about some interesting um, creative applications. Uh, but, yeah, why don't you do that? Well, I'm gonna, I'll talk a little bit about one that I want to do with, um, with AR and AI, which was a company for uh, travel, where the way you would travel is to in, interact with characters from the past who were located <laughs> at a space where, where that history happened. And you can have them right now. You can you can record them through um, through spatial, you know, 3D volumetric recording, or you can animate them with CG, and they can act out a little scenario in front of you. But what I really want to do with that is have those characters be able to answer questions, so that the um, the participant can actually interact with those characters, and those characters have an AI base so that they they have some intelligence, they know their subject matter, they know uh, historical facts, they can answer questions, they can deal with off-topic things like where do I find a pizza. Um, and this was a lot of work that I was uh, involved with at the Institute for Creative Technologies where they've done a number of really high-profile virtual humans. I want to see those virtual humans in, um, in AR 
acting, acting out uh, <laughs> for, for good or for, for worse. I mean, we could use a few um, and, saucy and, and, AR. And you can, you can fake that today with, uh, you know, uh, random access lap fades on with video recreations of historic characters or, or mm -hmm. uh, as, mm -hmm. as the Shoah Institute did. Yeah, and uh, yeah, so, but that was a pretty high level recording of those people. But right. it, for what Pauline's company is doing, the Augmented Expeditions, AI can play a role too by by con keeping a record of how these kids and most of it's for family travel, which she didn't mention, multi generational family travel. So it's a way to keep the kids engaged with something they know, like a Pokemon kind of thing, a gamified AR um, interaction. But what if that system also keeps a record of, of what that kid has experienced, what they, how they're learning, um, what their interests might be, so that they can match them with the appropriate uh, experience for that location. So I think AI is going to make things much more rich for the uh, end user in the future, personalized. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that you know we all know that personalization is going to be demanded by all of us, whether it's healthcare or apps or or our search results. So we've covered the fact that if if your project can be done in any other media besides AR, do it in that. Okay, <laughs> do not do AR just for AR's sake. Um, we you were talking about the creative uses. Um, we're getting into niche markets now. We know that AR is good for health. We know that it's good for fixing stuff. We know it's good for architects. We know it's good, but, but then, now we're getting into the niche markets. Um, there's a new um, app that allows you to, artists often have to project their work onto a screen in order to figure out how to draw their little mock-up onto a big screen. You can take your phone and you can sketch. It will tell you where to draw the lines as you're doing it like that. So that's a very niche thing that no one would have ever thought about. Um, so if you're in a company and you, you don't have kind of a niche mentality, get in the niche mentality. Mm -hmm. Think about what is this tool going to be used for mm -hmm. um, that they're going to buy this headset for? You know, a projector is really expensive. It might be seven. You know, it might be two thousand dollars worth of, of of use case. So there's also theater that we were mentioning too, where you can be on a corner. You see the actors that are not there doing the little scene. You have to go to another corner to see the next part of the story unfold. Mm -hmm. So um, we have one last thing. Bonnie's going to talk about education. And then I want to take a few questions. We have 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully, I'm not the only one talking about education. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I think we discussed outside that there's a lot of ways that people can actually get started or play around with the technology. and you know, just start experimenting. I know that um, hackathons and game jams are like taking over all the place. I was talking to Joe earlier about what your, the meta people are doing their hackathon. Uh, Global Game Jam is starting to heavily publicize VR uh, in all of their stuff. Usually there's sponsors behind it. Um, I know even some weird music festivals that I go to because I'm a musician have started enhancing VR and trying to get more musicians to learn how to incorporate their skill sets into that world. Um, as far as uh, the university angle and everything else, uh, people are starting to talk more about interactive audio design instead of just flat media design from the music angle. Uh, a lot of courses are incorporating FMOD, WISE, and other tools. Lovely. And uh, looking around the NAB show, a couple, I think it was only a couple weeks ago, there's a lot of companies starting to put out um, audio enhancement software that can work with 360 video and AR. So you can take that game mentality into positioning stuff in the real world uh, I think I may have said earlier that just because AR is on your phone, it doesn't have to be flat, similar to the domino experience. You can still spatially place things. You can have audio fade in and out. You can use it as a directional tool to help enhance the experience. And luckily, um, universities are starting to push that into our mindset. So if you know anyone who's learning audio or someone who's recently graduated uh, with a background in game audio, incorporate them into your planning for AR because they can bring a new thought process to how you're building something. Uh, yeah, I, w I just want to echo that because uh, I'll tell you, at my first company we invented enhanced CDs um, and, and we had many internal arguments about 
uh, whether or not we were, these, these were music, pro they were music products that we were building, but that was a marketing distinction. Everything we were actually building was all the interactivity, the immersion, the underlying technology to make it all work. The artist was supplying the music. Um, and today, when you look at it, I, I think if people are thinking about how to approach their projects, you know, you don't necessarily have to think of music as the enhancement, right? Yeah. Um, and, you know, you can actually look at these projects and say, let's look at who, what, when, where, and how, and the different aspects of it, and try shaking it up and rotating it a bit and looking at it from another angle, because I think that's where some of the real experimentation is going to uh, yield some um, incredible experiences that we, we, we just can't even imagine yet. And I'd like to, to do a shout out for the companies that are starting to put creation tools in into mm -hmm. their AR stuff. Like yeah. um, Lorraine Bardeen gave a talk this morning about the Microsoft HoloLens and they talked about 3D paint and they talked about their, their motion capture where you can grab these people and put them right in. And I think we need, we need more of that. We need ways for the ordinary person to enhance their own reality. And um, one thing that Pauline's totally company agree. is doing is creating an authoring tool and mm -hmm. I'd like her to talk about that mm. in yeah. terms of creation. So we're, we're working on creating um, custom-made guided tours that are, as Jackie had said, family-oriented. Um, but also we're developing a creation tool so that um, city tourism com commissions or schools or museums will be able to go and use the tool to design their own AR experience um, with whatever content that, that they're interested in using. Um, one of the other things that I wanted to add in terms of, of content that's sort of been touched on is, is how important I think it is to have a balance, um, and it, as it has been said, not AR heavy, not too content heavy. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the ways I found that so helpful to do that is that we have people on our advisory board who can barely use a smartphone. And, and so we've got all ends of the spectrum of people helping us build things. And because there are so many people in the world who aren't at the level that everyone in this room is at. And so we don't want to make something that's, that's too flashy and scary and people aren't going to be able to use. Mm -hmm. We also don't want something that's really underwhelming. So keeping a balance from all sides and all perspectives is something that's really important in terms of content development these okay. days. Yeah. And uh, if I can briefly add on top of that, and uh, one of the benefits is a lot of us were still very big pioneers in this area. I mean, VR and especially AR is so new uh, that many of us are just kind of learning as we go. And there's a lot of emerging um, like Facebook groups and communities online that I highly recommend people join and check out. I know that um, I'm a committee member of one that started last year at GDC called VAMR, uh, it's the IGDA Virtual Augmented Mixed Realities Group. And we held our first round table at GDC and there's a ton of people with great ideas from different aspects that we just need to keep in touch with each other and remind each other to uh, invite each other to test out the projects as we're doing them because maybe someone from a cinematic experience would have a great amount of input on testing out an and AR thing and vice versa because we all, again, come from it from a different mm -hmm. end of the spectrum. Uh, I, I would also like to add, I think it's really um, an interesting place to look at retail and um, also the commercial aspects of these and uh, highly encourage people to be looking at some of the cryptocurrencies and blockchain and how that plays into what we're doing with uh, AR because um, it's one of the ways you can keep your company alive. And yes. before we go to questions, I just want to put in my plug for art too because <laughs> art, art is a great way to do wonderful experimental pieces. I urge you all to look at the AR work of Tomiko Thiel who's been doing this for about six, seven years now. Okay, great. I just wanted to do a quick breakdown if you're if you're going to be getting into creating AR content of some of the software available to you. Number one, um, YouTube is your teacher, right? Mm -hmm. It's your custom teacher. And it's free. It'll teach you anything you want. <laughs> um, literally, you can do a 10-minute yes. YouTube video on how to use Unity and Vuforia and get your custom app ready to go. Yeah. So the first block of stuff are... Um, what we mentioned, Erasma, it's you jump in there and you do it and it's full feature, but it's not easy to install for your users, so it's better for prototyping unless you have fixed iPads on the scene. There's Augment, which is a lot of use for putting pr product placement in places. It holds the trigger really well once it's got it. You can kind of <coughs> flip it around. It's good for architecture. It's good for putting in. You cannot do sound in 3D. 3D is where you want to be, okay, because that's what makes augmented reality that wow factor. Um, there's also Blipper. 
Flipper use, is using um, machine vision or computer vision, excuse me, to understand the world. So you can show it, you know, a cup, a coffee cup, and it knows that that's a coffee cup. There's Wikitude that are trying to map things onto the world um, to tell you about it. Um, there's Zapper, which is really good. It has, um, it's a little bit more expensive. It's used a lot for um, within gaming. And there's Layer. Um, and that's a $340 a month. You can do the transparent video and the 3D. Mm -hmm. So um, the next block is custom stuff. So SDKs, we're talking about Kudan, we're talking about um, you know, Euphoria and things like that. That's where you want to go if you want to do a professional app. You want people to be able to download your app and be ready to go. Um, and then there's the third section, which is headset designs. So you're talking about, you know, for HoloLens and <clears throat> Meta and also Tango. So let's take a couple questions. We just have five minutes. <laughs> Anybody have a burning question out there? Yes. Yeah. Um, have, have you had any experience with uh, putting like smart or outdoor objects into uh, AR targets, or is it all? Like, uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah, sorry, by yeah. the way, I am going to be in, uh, showing my art installations. Could you in could place. you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah. The question that. is: Have you ever tried to transform a large object outside, you know, into something else using AR? Um, so I just wanted to let you know I'm going to show some of my artwork in the um, the playground at the expo hall. When I've done installations, I've taken like existing artwork, for example, having um, you know a rocket fly from one you know you know um, frame to the next. What you're talking about, you're going to either need a trigger that's really strong that they can back up from, and again, you're going to have to test which software can give you that height, or do geolocation. Hmm. So you're you know the geolocation is getting more accurate. But again, you're going to have to test that. You're probably better off with Geo unless, unless the sculpture has something. You can key off of 3D sculptures. Do you have to mark where the person has to stand in order to trigger? Um, we'll be doing some talks about um, uh, one large art piece that we're trying to use as a marker uh, in the AR for Tourism panel later this week. And so. there's people that are actually taking sculptures of men on horses and then putting other sculptures next to mm -hmm. it. You know what I mean? <laughs> So you might want to look up Women that project horses. and see yeah. Women how horses. close <laughs> the second object is to that big first sculpture. I think we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. um, maybe a question for Anne, um, just given the background in the music industry. Um, if you think about platforms like Pandora and um, Spotify and what they've done with music and think about um, uh, film, and vernacular of film. So if you're a Star Wars fan, or if you're a Harry Potter fan, or a Indiana Jones fan, any movie, and you wanted to augment your journey through time and space and overlay everything that you see with sort of that cinematic experience or that vernacular of film style, is that anything that, uh, that you've seen or encountered or people thinking about? Um, well, yeah, I think all of the uh, movie companies are thinking about how to reuse all of their assets. Um, uh, and, uh, but more than that, I think you're, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big proponent for not getting locked into last, you know, last century's art form that took, you know, 150 years to develop. Uh, you know, I, 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 I think story is incredibly important, and that's actually where I'm really focused right now, is trying to figure out how story, what story looks like and what it means uh, in a 3D world. And um, I, think, uh, I think you're going to start seeing, um, like Pokemon Go, you're going to see re reuse of assets to start. But, uh, you know, what, what Jackie was pointing to, the project she was doing a couple of years ago, you're still taking characters which might be branded or they might be original um, and, and adapting them to a different use. Uh, and that means, um, uh, you know, I, I, I say people should be looking at who, what, when, where, and how is a, good, is a really good kind of structure to start um, organizing that kind of thing. But yeah, I think script, whole script formats have to change. Thank you, pioneers. We look forward to seeing all the stuff that you create and um, make a lot of mistakes because that's what it's all about yep. and just get in there. Every one of you has the capability to create this stuff um, if first graders can do it. So just get in there <laughs> yeah. and try it out. And share your mistakes online with all the other mistake makers so we exactly. can learn from each other.